Welcome everyone to the post lunch session. Uh, the first talk of this session is going to be given by Professor Pablo Minini from University of Buenos Aires. And the title of his talk is Self-Organization and Critical Phenomena in Geophysical Turbulence. Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so thanks to the organizers, because uh, it has been a great opportunity to come and visit India. And also the, this has been a beautiful uh, meeting so far. So I will talk about uh, self-organization and critical phenomena in geophysical flows, but I will also talk a little bit about quantum turbulence and you will see where the connection is. So this is work. So the quantum turbulence was done a little bit with Alexandros Alexakis in Ecole Normale Superior in Paris in Lyon, in Paris in France. Rafael Marino has been working with us on geophysical turbulence. He's at Ecole Centrale. Adrian Bancan is now at Berkeley and Rafael Ofoldes and Fabio Ferraco are part of the group of Rafael Marino. So we have all seen pictures like this. This is Jupiter's um, giant red spot. And we are often told, maybe already, we already heard that in in this meeting, we're often told that there is some self-organization inverse cascade process sustaining this spot. And for people doing turbulence, this is really fun. And we say, okay, so now we have a prediction of theories that were fundamental in the 70s for the development of turbulence. But when you go and talk with people doing atmospheric sciences, the problem is not that simple. Okay, so what we know is that atmosphere, planetary atmospheres have very large scale, very energetic structures that in the case of this spot, they last for centuries, they are very stable. Sometimes, somehow they are gaining energy from the surroundings. And the earth also has large scale structures. And we would like to claim that the energy is really coming from the small scales, but I will tell you a story about why that's not necessarily true. Okay, and um, these will actually connect 3D turbulence with 2D turbulence because turbulence in these kind of atmospheres is strongly 3D and it's only 2D or quasi 2D at very, very large scale. So this, is, this will be the main motivation of my talk, whether today we have the tools to say something about these kind of problems from the point of view of the theory of turbulence. So let me tell you how the story started and why we believe there are some problems in our understanding of how inverse cascades can be understood from the point of view of atmospheric uh, turbulence. So everything started with Onsager 1949. Actually, so this is handwritten by Onsager and it's in a nice paper by Greg Eying and Sreni Vass and on Onsager contributions to fluid dynamics. So Onsager was one of the first to realize that something funny happens when flow are two dimensional. So what he did was Onsager was working on statistical mechanics, he considered gas of point vortices in 2D. Now, when you have point vortices in 2D, the point vortices act really like charges, like electrostatic charges. So the electrostatic potential in 2D, instead of going as one over R, goes as the logarithm of the distance between the point vortices. So then you can write the Hamiltonian, right? You have a potential for the interaction, which is just the product of all the circulations times the logarithm of the distances. Once you have a Hamiltonian, you can do statistical mechanics and find the, the equilibrium. And that's what Onsager did. You can actually identify here what today we call either the Gibbs ensemble or the canonical ensemble. So he did all the math and he found out that a gas of point vortices in 2D has a condensate similar to Bose-Einstein condensate. What condensates here instead of the mass or, or the momentum is the energy. Okay, so he predicted that these point vortices would 
self-organized at large scales. And that's very tempting from the point of view of the physics to say, okay, so many of the large scale patterns we see in nature are associated with these kinds of processes. But um, the atmosphere is not 2D and it's not comprised of a lot of point vortices. So the next step in this story was Kreichner. In 1967, he found a way to, how to get rid of the point vortices. What he did was he thought of the fluid as just a gas of Fourier modes, right? And then you, you go into the continuum description, and then you can write the energy as, so you can think of this as an, just a gas of ex excitations in momentum or in Fourier space. So then you can write the energy as the sum of the velocity square for each Fourier mode. You can write the entropy in this way. You can do, again, the canonical ensemble. Uh, ensemble. Now for the continuum case, and he found the statistical equilibrium for a gas of Fourier modes in 2D. And he predicted the spectrum for the energy in the statistical equilibrium and the spectrum for the entropy. The spectrum for the entropy thermalizes. So the entropy, the entropy is equi equidistributed between all modes, so it reaches equipartition. But the energy piles up at the smallest wave number you have in the system. So the largest scale energy, for example, in this case, we associate k equal one to the smallest wave number. This is actually from Kreichner paper, energy piles up at k equal one. And then if you do a numerical simulation, this was done in the eighties, I think by David Montgomery and Scheuss, or maybe by Montgomery and Bill Matthews. But then if you just integrate the system for very, very long times, either in the truncated ideal case or in the viscous freely decaying case, you end up with either a dipole or a shit, so either the zero one mode in Fourier space or the one zero. So this is the energy piles up at large scales. And this is also, it was a breakthrough from these ideas like the inverse cascading turbulence started to develop. It's a beautiful result, but the atmosphere is not 2D. So the next important steps came from Charney and in a related context by Scheuss and Montgomery. So Mo David Montgomery and Scheuss were working on this long-term evolution of 2D Navier Stokes. Charney was trying to get an equation for the slow manifold. So for the slow evolution of the modes in the atmosphere, we are talking planetary scales, 1000 kilometers or larger. And he did an asymptotic expansion for the very, very large scales in the Earth atmosphere, and he derived what we today call the quasi-geostrophic equations. These equations were another breakthrough, okay? So for a long time, weather forecasts and even climate simulations were done solving these type of equations. In the last 20, 30 years, this has changed, but for a long, long time, these were the equations that this were describing planetary scale dynamics in our atmosphere. So if you work in, on plasma physics, you may recognize these equations also as Hasegawa Mima. So these equations appear in many, many different contexts. And what Charney showed is that um, actually this system also has an inverse cascade. So now it gets a little bit more realistic because these equations, so this Q is the total potential entropy in the system. So total potential vorticity. So it considers the vorticity coming from the rotation of the earth, the, vorti the, vor the vorticity in the fluid, the vorticity you can generate by stretching uh, vortex lines in the vertical direction. So it's a sort of total pot potential vorticity in the atmosphere. And this equation predicts uh, an inverse cascade and it's really nice. Now it takes into account vertical gradients in some way, but it's only valid at very, very large scales. So then you may say, okay, maybe there is in planetary atmospheres an inverse cascade associated with these dynamics, 
But the truth is you go to 1,000 kilometers in the atmosphere and you don't have a lot of room to push energy to even larger scales, right? So in the 80s, uh, the situation concerning applications of turbulent theory to these kind of atmospheric phenomena reached a level at which I think this beautiful paper by Montgomery and Kreichner in the 80s summarizes in this way. And I know from a personal discussion that David Montgomery wrote this paragraph. So the final, his style can be recognized here. So the final paragraph in this review states the following, and this is, so it, it does seem proper to stress that great caution must be used when interpreting phenomena of the real world in terms of asymptotic solutions of approximate statistical treatments of idealized theory. And this is beautiful. In some cases, the idealized theory may be more valid in providing a language for discussion rather than a true explanation. And for a long, long time, this has been the status. Like, inverse cascade provide a language to describe some phenomena in very generic terms. But in many, many cases, the true explanation we are willing to accept it may be different. In the atmosphere, we have injection at planetary scales of energy. We know that there is a direct cascade that is very strong coming, for example, from uh, baroclinic instabilities, from planetary scales to smaller scales. But we may still wonder, is there some inverse transfer? And if there is, it has a huge impact because, for example, when we talk about predictability in the atmosphere, the direction in which the, the energy is transferred changes, among other things, results about predictability. So a lot of things have been done in 2D turbulence, and I can't review everything in 35 minutes. So I will skip forward to something that I think was really important when it comes to trying to tackle these problems from the realistic point of view people in atmospheric sciences probably expect. In the last 10 years, people started to see transitions when some parameters were continuously changed. And they started to see actual 3D flows starting to develop 2D-like behavior in some specific configurations. Okay, so I think the first paper doing this was by Celani and collaborators. Then Alex Akis started to work a lot with this. It is a beautiful review paper by Alex Akis and, and Luca Viferale from a couple of years ago, five years ago. Uh, and this sort of summarizes the situation. So let's say you take a 3D box with a hydrodynamical fluid, 3D turbulence inside. Okay, so just Navier Stokes. And you start to make, there are several things you can do, but one is, you start to make your box thinner and thinner and thinner. And that's what Celani and Musacchio and Vincenzi did at that time. What they found is at some point, the direction of the energy cascade reverses. And instead of having a direct energy cascade, for a finite size domain, the energy goes to larger scales. Now, this is from a paper by, recent paper by Alex Akis. So this is from the point of view of a controlling parameter, it's better because this is continuous. So this is the ratio of the injection scale, so the scale at which we put energy into the system to the height of the domain. And as you change it, what you see here is the amount, the fraction of energy flux that goes to larger scales. And you see there is a sort of transition in which there is no inverse cascade. You reach some critical value and suddenly, the, cas the inverse cascade kicks in. So this has been seen in a lot of systems by now. So this is for uh, just Navier Stokes in a 3D box. Now, if you try to put realistic numbers here, so this is promising that this is not the final solution to the atmospheric problem and, or either Jupiter or the Earth. And the reason for that is, if you just do Navier-Stokes in a box and you try to make your box thinner and thinner, 
the aspect ratios you need or the scale or, or the ratio of the injection scale to the height you need to see this transition are not realistic for the parameters we know, for example, for the Earth atmosphere. But before going there, let me tell you some other results related with these kind of transitions. So beyond Navier-Stokes, now there are many, many systems for which these kind of transitions have been observed. MHD, plasma physics, so in many different cases, uh, people started to see that depending on some controlling parameter, you get a change in the large scale behavior of the system. So what you see here is these are Bose-Einstein condensates. These are experiments. Uh, there were in 2019 two experiments doing this, one from Australia and one from uh, South Korea. So this is one of the two experiments. This I think was published in Nature. So what you see here, these are actual measurements and this is proportional to, this goes like, like the inverse of the density. So this is a way to track where quantized vortices are. So this is just like the talks before in the morning. This is quantum turbulence in a Bose-Einstein condensate in a trap. And you see there are two regimes, right? So there is a regime in which there are these clusters here and this regime that is more disordered. And this is an attempt to try to reconstruct the vorticity in these structures, combining experiments and simulations. And you see there is a regime in which there is a large scale dipole structure and there is a regime in which there is a mess. And the way they get it is by changing the aspect ratio of the trap. There are other ways, but that's one way to get it. This is also, this will be interesting later. So this is a number of vortices as a function of time, or you, think, you can think of some measure of the energy, kinetic energy in the system. And you see that in one regime, the, um, the energy remains more or less constant or the number of vortices in the other one in decays, which also hints there is a transition in the direction of the cascades. And this is also an estimation of the length of the vortices, and there is also a change in the behavior. So in one case, it grows. In the other case, it remains constant. So these are, I will show you a couple of movies next that um, are very visual on what is going on in this system. But what you see here is similar to the result by the previous result by Alex Alexakis. This is the ratio of inverse energy flux to the total energy flux in gross pitevsky simulations. And the controlling parameter here, there are simulations with different controlling parameter, but for what matters for this talk, some of these points are for just changing the aspect ratio of the domain. And you see that again, for some aspect ratio, we have no inverse cascade. There is a critical value, and then there is a very strong inverse transfer. So how does this look? So what you see here, this is a 3D. So these are quantized. Uh, these are quant this is, these are quantum vortices. Uh, what you see here is a random initial condition, mostly vertical vortices, but there is a 3D perturbation. You can hear there is a strong one, but it's mostly weak for most of the vortices. And the aspect ratio you can guess because this is the horizontal and this is the vertical length scale. So if I let this evolve, it goes quickly into a 3D system, right? So vortices reconnect, we start to get these rings and we have the usual quantum turbulence we, we expect in a box, just like the quantum turbulence we saw in the morning. Now, this is right just just on the other side of the transition. And now you see that we have clusters of vortices. So we have these clusters, we have these voids, and the system is really self-organizing into larger and larger scales. And if somebody is interested in this paper, we have the fluxes, we have the spectra, energy is really going into larger and larger scales. Now that's, not the only way to control the transition from, so the aspect ratio. So uh, one simulation was on this side, 
the other simulation was just on this side. So they're on the right and on the left of the critical transition. So that's not the only way to get these kind of transitions. So another way is you take a both Einstein condensate, so again, gross Pitaevsky, now in a cigar trap uh, with uh, potential. So the gas is confined. So this is how it looks like. So you get, but now the system is rotating, just like some of the talks we heard in the morning. And there is a critical value. So this is seen from the top. You can actually see there is a deformed um, abricos of lattice in this system. Now, there is a critical value of the rotation below which the quantum gas cannot rotate. Because, and the reason for that is the circulation associated with the total rotation is not enough to excite just one vortex in the abricos of lattice. So here, what I'm plotting is the rotation rate as a function of that critical value. Now, it is known from experiments that you actually need larger values of the rotation to trigger the lattice because just one vortex energetically is not very convenient. And there are corrections coming from finite size traps and so on. So what you see here is another way to estimate the direction of the cascade. This is the logarithmic derivative of the, of the kinetic energy. So then what you expect is if the system is 3D, energy will decay as a power law as the system becomes more and more 2D, the, the decay of the energy will go slowly to a constant. And so this is the logarithmic derivative of the energy as a function of time. No, no the logarithmic derivative in time of the energy. And this is as a function of omega divided by the critical omega. And you see it remains constant. We reach this value of two, and then it starts to decrease. And here, what you see is the length of the vortices. It seems to reach a maximum at some critical value, and then it decreases, reminiscent of what we know of critical transitions. So this is, so we know, now we know of many, many systems that have this kind of critical transitions. As we change some controlling parameter, which can be the rotation, the aspect ratio of the domain, the scale at which we forced compared with the height of the box or other external parameters. So now I will go into the atmospheric problem. So, so this actually started right before the pandemics. We, we were in, I think we were in Nice with uh, Alexandros Alexakis and we said, maybe all the tools are in place to try to now try and try to get with realistic parameters, the transition towards an inverse cascade in an atmospheric setup. So something that connects the, th the theory of 2D turbulence with what happens in, in planetary atmospheres, but is realistic in the sense that we are not confining the flow to be 2D. So what you see here is a minimum model for a dry atmosphere. So let me, I will go into the details, but let me first put it in the following way. This is the minimum set of equations that captures all the relevant physics of the fluid in a planetary atmosphere. Okay, so what you see here is the Boussinesque equation. So one equation for the velocity, this is just like Navier-Stokes. It has rotation, so we have Coriolis force. It has buoyancy forces, and then one equation that can be for either density fluctuations or temperature fluctuations. It's trivial to go from one to the other, just doing some thermodynamics under the Boussinesse approximation. Okay, so one equation for the velocity, one equation for the temperature. We will inject forcing mechanically in this system. So we'll inject energy with a mechanical force in this system. And now comes the fun. So quick reminder, this system is, it captures all the relevant physics of fluid dynamics at the scales we're interested in. Then you can add more things. You can add moisture, you can add chemistry, you can add small scale effects, 
associated with a lot of things in the atmosphere. But if you just re restrict yourself to the most simple description that is 3D, non-hydrostatic, this is the model. Okay? No large scale friction. Yeah. So what I will show you, we did several simulations, but I will put the focus on a simulation that has a vertical height of 15 kilometers. And the choice is not random. It's between 10 and 12, 15 kilometers is what we call the, um, the troposphere where, where all the weather we see happens. Okay, so above that, we have the, stratof the stratosphere, which is very calm. So the part of the atmosphere that affects our daily life is it has a height between 10 and 15 kilometers. So box height, 15 kilometers, box length, 480 kilometers, and the spatial resolution in the three directions will be 39 meters, okay? So it's a, from the point of view of the physics of the atmosphere, resolving eddies of 30 meters is very good. We expect most of the dissipation to start kicking in there. You can say, you, can, you may say, okay, larger Reynolds number may be nice. That's always nice. We always want that. But this resolution is really good from that point of view. So that means a lot of grid points. Now, the Reynolds number based on integral scales is 2, 10 to the 6. And this is important. Seeing the Rossby number at the box size is 0.4, which is exactly what we get in the atmosphere, and the fruit number is 0.01. So these parameters are realistic for the Earth atmosphere. We are not pushing it to the regime in which you artificially may get some enhanced inverse cascade. So few clarifications. So the forcing, this simulation was, and all the simulations we did were expensive. So um, the forcing will be three-dimensional, in isotropic acting at 15 kilometers. So we are trying to mimic in a cheap computational way injection of energy just by local convection in the atmosphere. And except for that, the, so we are not restricting the forcing to geostrophic modes. We are forcing all modes, no selection of specific modes. And except for that, globally, this atmosphere is stably stratified which for the Earth atmosphere and for planetary atmospheres is very good. Most of the time, atmospheres are stably stratified. So we did simulations with GHOST. GHOST is a code we maintain that uh, has been running many, many different cases, but we have validated against, against experiments. It's a pseudo-spectral code. We have used it for other uh, atmospheric problems. This is a volcanic eruption in a stably stratified atmosphere. By the way, we also have a code that can do boundaries and convection. We have used a little bit uh, of this code just to validate whether the effect of the boundaries in what I'm going to show you was relevant or not. The short uh, disclaimer is no. So even with different boundary conditions, you can still get an inverse cascade. And the, these simulations were done in France with a, in a bull supercomputer with almost 80,000 cores and using uh, uh, an infiniband network. We didn't use GPUs for, for this run, but uh, Ghost and Spectre have support for GPUs. So this is the quick, quick, fast introduction to the results. So what you see here is, this was done at the lower resolution, of course, but what you see here is, this is omega, so the rotation rate. This is n, which is the brun weissala frequency, and it's associated with the frequencies of gravity waves in the atmosphere. And it's a measure of how strongly stratified the atmosphere is. And what you see here, the no, yes, is whether there is or there is no inverse cascade. And all the yeses are yes, there is an inverse cascade. Now, the good news is actually, so you see there is a transition. Uh, we don't have a lot of points, but there is a transition just by, by changing omega and by changing the brun weissala frequency, you go from inverse to direct cascades. But what is 
most in, more important here is that this line is actually, the parameters here are relevant for realistic planetary atmospheres. It's not, you know, these plots in which, oh, and planetary atmospheres are far away. So this is the box. This is temperature in the box. Just to give you an idea, this may be a movie, no, the next one will be. So to give you an idea, so this is the entire box. This is a zoom just in this box. And this is a zoom just in this region. You can see we have Kelvin, Hel Kel Kelvin uh, billows and so on. So this you can keep zooming in and it has a lot of detail. So this is, uh, so here we are just moving across the box. Uh, the, the low resolution is just because I'm using zoom to transmit and it's compressing. But so here what you see is the velocity, but you can see that there are these huge large scale patterns that are of the order of several hundreds of kilometers when we are only forcing at 15 kilometers. So this is the actual time evolution in, in the system. The other thing that happens is we have these horizontal winds that we can actually see in the atmosphere, right? So, and, and this is a well-known feature of these kind of flows. So you have winds pointing in different directions in different layers. These are called vertically sheared horizontal winds. You just open your window and you see the clouds going in one direction and in another layer going in the opposite direction. So the spectra. So this is the isotropic spectrum. So let's just look at the total energy. So this is a forcing scale. So basically this is one over 15 kilometers. And you see that, so we have a K to the minus five thirds. And so all this is just because this has to do with the anisotropy of the box and we want to be very straightforward on how, how things are computed. But so this is the average of our several shells in Fourier space, total energy, we have K to the minus five thirds and flux is positive. So forward cascade of energy, but then you see this K to the minus five thirds growing at larger scales. And there is five, just 5% 5 of inverse energy flux. Now, dependence with the Reynolds number. So here you have the inverse flux as a function of the Reynolds. And this is good news because it increases as we increase the Reynolds and it seems to saturate. So even if we could keep increasing resolution, we expect this to give us more or less the same amount of flux. Now, 5% is a beautiful number because as I told you before, we expect a forward cascade in the atmosphere from even larger scales. But from the 70s, people computed what, what was the minimum amount of flux to fill the spectral gap in the atmosphere. This was done by Lily and by many other people. And the number is 5%. So 5% of inverse flux sustained in time is a lot of energy and it has an impact on the energy balance of the atmosphere. So a few more plots, I still have two minutes. So, so this is the perpendicular spectrum. This is what you measure when, for example, you are doing measurements on an airplane or, or you have satellite images. So minus five thirds, minus three, minus five thirds, or something like that. This is the parallel spectrum that has a minus five thirds and some minus three here maybe, but this is the perpendicular flux. And you see that now if you do perpendicular measurements, it looks like the inverse flux is huge. And this is a cautionary tale because in many, many cases, there are recent papers measuring inverse fluxes in Jupiter. And if you just have horizontal measurements, you overestimate the flux. Now, this is the atmospheric spectrum. So between, wave, so at scales between thousands of kilometers and tens of kilometers, what we, what people measure is K to the minus five thirds. These are measurements at even smaller scales. So this is 10 kilometers. So this is roughly our forcing scale here. So 10 kilometers, it's interesting because the most recent measurements also see a 
kink of the spectrum at that scale. So you have minus five thirds, the spectrum becomes a steeper, and then it may go back to a minus five thirds around one kilometer. Maybe a coincidence, we don't know. I don't want to overclaim anything because uh, we are missing some important effects at small scale. So last plot, this is, so what you see here is just a decomposition of the energy into the slow modes, which here are quasi-geostrophic modes and gravity waves. So red means a lot of energy in gravity waves. Blue here means no energy in gravity waves, those are quasi-geostrophic modes. These are perpendicular and parallel wave numbers. So what happens is the energy we put in the forcing scales goes to smaller scales through gravity waves, but some energy leaks into the 2D modes. And the 2D modes, because of the aspect ratio, are maintained stable, so then they feed quasi-geostrophic modes. And there is a lot of energy, this is total energy, so even at scales of 20 kilometers, the system self-organizes exciting quasi-geostrophic modes. And this, from the point of view of atmospheric sciences, for us is surprising because people expected quasi-geostrophic modes to be relevant at scales of thousands of kilometers. Okay, so thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. A very quick question. People claim, and I believe they are right, that the inverse cascade depends very much also on the temporal properties of the forcing. Do, do you use a, a forcing that has the proper the, the urinal cycles and things like that? Or how do you So force? this is random forcing. Delta are... correlated in time. Yeah. We have tried with delta correlated and we have also tried with, um, you know, slowly evolving some kind of stern Uhlenbeck. And for the big simulation, we ended up doing random, but with some small correlation in time because, you know, it's, it's just easier to adjust the, the parameters. But yes. Uh, further to this work, uh, you quoted by Chilani and this about sick layer and the threshold it too. Yeah. Uh, there was a sequel to this work, which was experimented by Michael Schatz oh, in yeah. 2011, which showed that actually there could be an inverse cascade even when it's sick as in two. Yes, you're right. Yeah, I didn't mention any experiments, but you are totally right. Yes. Mm. Yeah. There is a, a very nonlinear self-organization. Yes. Yeah. So what the stratification and the rotation add to this is that if you put numbers here, you you don't get a realistic inverse cascade in the atmosphere. Uh, exactly. You can get a large vortex. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So your minimal model is uh, completely two-dimensional, right? It's purely two-dimensional. The minimal model there too. Uh, the which one? The it, what? The one that you. you, you the one we're worked. integrating. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No. 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 It's fully three D. Uh, okay. This because, is okay. I just wondered the viscosity if it can get like some eddy viscosity at larger scales, since you, you you're gonna have a inverse cascade. So maybe the the, the eddy viscosity uh, associated to vertical motions. So yes. So yeah. okay. So two things. So this is a fully three D set of equations, and we are exciting the flow. This forcing excites in Fourier space. It's isotropic. So the the two dimensionalization is a result of the nonlinear dynamics, uh, and then. The viscosity and the diffusivity are set to get dissipation at the smallest uh, result scales. So we are not using any subgrid model. That's one of the nice things of getting a resolution of 39 meters. So we don't have any contamination from maybe the subgrid model is doing this for, for us. We could add, so then there is a discussion whether you can add hypoviscosity to model these kinds of processes. But this is, so the, the self-organization here comes just from the nonlinearity. Excuse me, about the gross task simulation, yes. what determines the critical value of the aspect ratio? Yes. Uh, That's yeah, a very part. good question. Yes. So, um, okay, so that's a very good question. 
the controlling parameter seems to be basically, so it, it's similar to, to what I said about the atmosphere. You need the, the vertic so you need the thickness of the box to be such that you prevent instabilities in the, th in the third direction. So, um, so then the, if you don't have rotation, the only thing you are left with is a competition between the curvature of the vortices and the thickness of the vortices. So then the critical parameter is proportional to several thicknesses of the vortices. You can actually see a little bit of that in the simulations because here you see they get deformed and here they get deformed in the third direction, but it's not enough to tilt them. Um, now, if you, on top of this, add rotation, that actually changes everything because rotation helps preventing instabilities in the third direction. You can, so we, we weren't able to estimate the critical value explicitly. What we know is it's proportional to some, so it, it, it must be proportional to some so it has to be proportional to the healing length, but it's something like 10 times or 20 times the healing length. It's not the healing length, okay? Yeah, the after minus three, the minus five third that you show, do you see any indication of that in your flux that, uh, you know, that you well, have yeah. inverse flux and then again a forward flux because that, it, it looks quite remarkable that after a minus three entropy cascade, you again have a energy forward energy cascade, right? Well, and so, you're not forcing over there. In it. So what happens is the following. Um, when you reach this scale, you're reaching the void. So here you have a lot of physics and a lot of internal scales in the system. So this scale here is the buoyancy scale, which is proportional to the height of the layers. So once you reach this scale, you expect the system to really become isotropic in the sense that these scales and the scales here should, be, should behave in the same way, k perp and k parallel. Above this scale, that cannot happen because even if the flow wants to develop strong turbulence, motions in the horizontal direction are, are larger than motions in the vertical. Our lambda, oh, I, yeah, it's a still, so I, I, can, I can give you numbers, I don't remember them, but, but the flow is a still turbulent. There is a still a lot of room in Fourier space. So with that, uh, let's give our speaker another round of applause.